Welcome to this class. This is the second run of our neuromuscular rehabilitation course. There's a couple of people, Lane and Annalisa were in the original version, which, um, so you guys are gonna have to be my feedback monitors here. Um, trying to put the class uh, together. They, I put them through a lot getting through that first neuromuscular class. I think what you'll find is there's a lot of information here. Um, and what I did is I gave you too much information and I'm going to give you too much information again because I love, I love information. <laughs> but I'm gonna try and make it really clear and really applicable for you guys so that you have a resource of information, which is what I'm hoping to give you. It's really a big resource um, with some practical applications that make sense for you to use in the studio. And I will most definitely not be able to answer all your questions right away, um, but I will do my best to find answers to the questions I don't know. My specialty is no longer in neurological rehabilitation, although I do have some outpatient neurological clients, um, but I um, do focus more on orthopedic type of rehab, um, chronic pain. We're now really focusing on EDS, um, so I do have a broad range and I started out actually in neurological rehab. So, um, we wanted to dig in and get more information. So we did, um, and this is what we came up with. So we're still super happy to share it with you. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I will forward to all of you, um, probably by next week, because I'm trying to just I keep working on it and I keep making it better. And I thought for today, it should be fine for you to just follow along with my screen and then um, I will, I'm will i gonna add some to it for the next time as well. And um, what you can expect from today is this is um, probably gonna take us about, I would say around eight weeks to get through this module, um, maybe a little bit less, but then I always leave time for questions. So I I love your questions. I love to be have an engaged, engaged session. So I try not to take away time from the questions just to get through the material. So um, if you are on a tighter timeline um, and you let me know, I can do my best to get, get through a little faster if we need to, but I just, I like taking the time so that we really get in depth with material, understand it, and have time to really go over some case studies and things like that at the end too, and ask lots of questions and figure things out. That said, today I'm gonna try something I haven't tried before. I'm gonna share my screen with you at first, and then we're gonna get to a little bit of the anatomy. I'm gonna try and share two screens at once. I think I know how to do that perfectly, we'll see so that I can, I'll show you the pictures of the anatomy that I'm talking about, as well as the slide. Um, if that doesn't work out, I'll just show you the anatomy and then go back to the slides after. But so I'll ask you to bear with me with my technological challenges a little bit as we move through today. Um, as we're a pretty small group, you guys are welcome to interrupt me and ask questions. If I'm gonna get to the answer, I will tell you I'm gonna get there. If I'm not gonna get to the answer, um, and it's, uh, I can try and answer right away, or if it's uh, appropriate for later, I'll say, can we hold that and we'll just move later, but feel free to, I'm not fantastic at checking the chat because I get so focused. So it's almost better if you just wave at me and, and ask a question. Yeah, all right, so off we go. I'm gonna share my screen. Any questions before we get started? No? Do you guys do you guys want to know a little bit more about me? I didn't really I don't really talk about myself. I'll tell you just for a moment. I'm Zaina Griffoni. I am a physical therapist, first Pilates instructor just after physical therapy. Um, I kind of graduated both at the same time because I just felt like there was a bigger need out there than what I learned in terms of movement in PT school. And I was at the time working as an acrobat in the circuit in circus arts and so I was working with those, those were my clientele and I just wanted more for them and then I started working in all fields of physical therapy actually really loved neuro was debating between neuro and orthopedic and it was the circus that pushed me in the direction of orthopedic so that turned into my focus um and then I opened a Pilates studio in 2005 in California and um from there, things just took off. I went off on my own as a physical therapist because I couldn't do what I felt like I needed to do to help people the best way I could in the confines of insurance and billing and in a PT clinic. And that's how I ended up on my own actually. Um, and then we built that studio up. And then during COVID, we picked up and moved to Switzerland where my husband's from. So um, now I have a studio here as well. 
Um, I go back and forth some to California, um, not as much as California wants me to, but more than Switzerland wants me to. So I feel I feel loved. It's really nice. <laughs> and I've been focusing on educating, doing teacher trainings for Pilates instructors, trying to educate really PTs and Pilates instructors as much as I can about movement work, um, about um, rehab, and about anything that anybody asks me, I try and learn enough to share. So that's sort of where I am in my journey. And I'm just really thrilled. This is one of my favorite things is just working with people and talking through learning more information. So I'm really thrilled to be here to be able to do this. So, all right, that being said, I will share my screen here. All right, so I would call the course, How Do We Move Anyway? Because we, I feel like we get so stuck into our world of movement and we're like, yeah, you gotta move this muscle, you gotta activate this muscle, you gotta move in this way. And then, you know, the question's always rolling around in the back of my head, uh, but how do we actually move anyway? That's how this was born really, is I wanted to dig into more of how we are moving and why we're moving the way we're moving, not just in a muscular sense, but at, at a level beyond that. So that's how this course was born. For the objectives, um, really what I would love for you to take away from here is just to understand what is what are we talking about when we're talking about neuroanatomy, which for me was always this big, like neuroanatomy, gosh, isn't that what the really smart people in university study? I don't know if I'm smart enough for neuroanatomy, but um, it's just basically the science of the brain or the, the anatomy of the brain and spinal cord um, and then all the little things that talk from the brain into your muscles, right? So that makes it sound much more attainable to me. So what we want to do is basically understand that. What are the basic functions of the brain and spinal cord, which would be our central nervous system? And just talk a little bit through what the parts and functions of the brain areas are, just so you have an idea when something goes wrong, what are we talking about in the brain, perhaps? Um, then we also have the peripheral nervous system that we'll talk about. We're going to try and understand how the brain and body communicate to create motion. Understand also there's a little segment on muscles. I think that's in our second module. And then learn about those common neurological dys dysfunctions and how they present. And what I've done is I've put some of the uh, dysfunctions in each of the modules that seem to go best with the stuff we were talking about in each module. So at the end of this module, we'll talk over a few and, and I'll tell you which ones of the diagnoses and in each module we will focus on the ones that are most relevant to that, what we've just been discussing. And then um, we we'll also wanna really learn how to create an appropriate Pilates repertoire for people with neurological deficits or, and or challenges, right? So that's really what we're out there doing is helping people creating exercise routines, movement practices for them so that we can help them live a better and more full life. So that's really what I hope you take out of this at the, at the very end. Okay, so in this module in particular, we're gonna talk about that brain and spinal cord anatomy. How do they interact? How do we function, right? And then we're gonna move into, we'll talk about strokes. We'll talk about Parkinson's disease. We'll talk about cerebral palsy. We'll talk about ataxia. We'll talk about MS, multiple sclerosis, and Huntington's disease. And then the practical Pilates applications we've put, I'm gonna be talking about these in every module. So basically, we'll look at what are what is the client gonna complain about when they have one of these things going on? What symptoms are we looking out for? We're also learn what the contraindications might be for that patient population, that client population. And then what Pilates exercises we can do. And I, I capitalize that because we can do a lot of Pilates exercises. In fact, we can do a lot of the repertoire with a lot of different people, but which are the ones that are gonna best serve the client at their stage in recovery and with what they have going on. So that's really that you can, you can do it, all of them, but these are the ones that will serve them the most or how do we provide most value for those clients. And then we'll look at some case studies um, and some videos that just will help us put this together, uh, the pieces together so that we can help our clients in the best way possible. And then for module two, I won't, I won't hang out here too long for now, but we'd be talking about the peripheral nervous system and really talking more about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. And we'll talk about peripheral nerve dysfunctions. We'll talk about B12 deficiency briefly and Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease. And then the same thing, we'll go into those apl practical applications. The third module is gonna be fun 
uh, focus on muscles, on how do muscles work, and muscles and virus, virally induced nerve disorders. So how do muscles work and what, what dysfunctions go along with that or may go along with that? And then what are some virally induced nerve disorders that we might see um, like Guillain-Barre, Lyme disease and, and polio, or we won't hopefully not see much polio, but maybe some people who have suffered from polio years ago who are now older. So that's sort of what the whole course looks like. Um, and these, I left this in, these are the conditions we're gonna cover in, in the whole program. And then off we go. And I called it Neuroanatomy 101 just because it brought fond memories of school back. So here we are, Neuroanatomy 101. Um, okay, so we wanna, I wanna first introduce to you a little bit about the nervous system. So the nervous system, if we think of it this way, right? We think of our muscles as the, you can think of your muscles as like the big bully, the big things that actually move you through space, right? We use our muscles to bend it, uh, to get up and down from the ground. We, they carry our bodies, they lift things up from the floor for us. But the nervous system is what tells our muscles what to do. Right. If that's that's the way you know um, that to pick something up from the floor, you have to bend down, reach down, bend your elbow, pick up the bag. Right. How do we get that message across? And that's why the nervous system is interesting to me is, is it's that it's everything from direct messaging to muscles to sequencing of movements to coordination of movements. Right. So without all of that happening in the subconscious or happening behind the scenes in the backstage, we can't move our muscles adequately. We can't move our bodies adequately. And so this that happens as a result of either an injury or an illness um, going on. So if we wanna divide in the nervous system, we can't just talk about the central nervous system, but we're gonna focus on that for our purposes today. But the central nervous system, just know that's brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is going to be the somatic or voluntary and autonomic, which is the involuntary nervous systems. That's going to be the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And you guys have probably heard of those in terms of sympathetic being that fight or flight and the parasympathetic being the rest and digest, right? So fight or sympathetic nervous system, you can think of that as I'm running away from a lion in the woods. Hopefully you don't have lions in the woods. But if you were, that would be your sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic, ner parasympathetic nervous system is what you need. You need calm also. You need calm times in your body so that you can digest your food, so you can wind down, um, so that you can rebuild. Your body can rebuild muscles. If you've been working your muscles hard, for example, you need that time, uh, downtime, not always being in that sympathetic nervous system. We are not going to focus a lot on sympathetic versus parasympathetic in this uh, in this course, we're going to really focus more on uh, what is happening in the peripheral nervous system. We'll talk about the voluntary versus involuntary um, actions that it does and kind of the feedback loops that we get that relate back to the brain and spinal cord. So if we looked at it in a schema, just because I love pictures more than words, Central nervous system, we're just talking about brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is our voluntary nervous system and our involuntary. The involuntary drives the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And then um, if we looked at the brain and spinal cord, we want to talk about what each of those is doing for us, right? So the brain is, oops, my pictures are gone. Hold on. The brain, um, is processes turned into action. So we have thoughts, we have needs, and we have emotions in the brain. We, we control our conscious activity from the brain. We also produce emotion. We can perceive or create sensation. And that's our basis for perception of the world is all happening in the brain. In the spinal cord, we have this highway of information coming and going into the brain and out from the brain. So, and that highway is your spinal cord, if you would. So it's going to get to get all the way to that peripheral nervous system, which allows us to create voluntary movement. So our reflexes can occur, occur only in the spinal cord, never get transmitted to the brain. Um, and those would be kind of those tendon reflexes, which is what, you know, you go to the doctor's office and they tap on your, the front of your knee. That's a tendon reflex. That's just happening 
at the level of the spinal cord. We can do that here, there. We can do that at your um, above your elbow. We can do that at your Achilles. Um, it also includes uh, the eye blink response or the startle response. So that startle response, you're not doing that on purpose. You can't actually stop that from happening if you're actually truly startled. The eye blink response when somebody throws something at your face is also a reflex. You can't really stop that from happening. It just happens because it's not happening through your brain. It's just happening at the level of the spinal cord. And then the other is chickens with their, running around with their heads cut off. That happens because that's a reflex, right? That's not because they still are getting signals from their brain telling them to run around after their heads get cut off. My mom used to say that she would watch the butcher cut the head off the chicken and it would make her so sad to see the chicken running around without its head. The two main functions of the central nervous system are integrating information that comes from the peripheral nervous system and coordinating muscle activity, both conscious muscle activity and unconscious muscle activity. So we're going to dive into this introduction of the brain. I'm going to pull up one model at a time just to share pictures with you about of the brain that we can kind of um, manipulate. So that's why it's kind of fun to have this a lot live and running. All right. So here we are, the skeletal anatomy. It, the skeletal anatomy is not super important for you to remember, per se. But it's just nice to review. Um, and it also goes with with the brain anatomy, right? So the bones on the outside are pretty much the same names as the, the structures on the, or the parts of the brain on the inside. So here we have all the different um, parts. We have the bones of the brain that are put together by the sutures. Um, these are fibrous joints. But by the time we're adults, unless you have a severe hypermobility issue, these joints don't really move, right? We close up this little hole, that's the hole when babies are born with these sutures, and then we have our different um, areas of the brain. So we have all the different areas. We have the frontal bone here, which is this green area. We have the parietal bone here on the right. We're also gonna have that on the left side here. That would be our left parietal bone. We have the temporal bone on the left. We're also going to have that on the right, which is going to be here. We have the mandible, the jaw, right, all here. And then we have the other smaller bones, the zygomatic bone. We have the, oops, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. I'm used to doing this on my iPad, not with a mouse. So, <laughs> And then we have the occiput. Here's where we wanted to get to the occiput. Um, so occiput would be back here. Temporal bone again on the side, frontal. Right? And so these are all going to go with the what we talk about in the brain. Well, the meninges are a different issue. We're going to look at those as well. Um, they are down in here. They're, the meninges are the layers between the skull and the brain. And they have a great importance for us because they um, protect the brain from, their layers that protect the brain from any damage or injury. Um, okay, I'll find them when we get to the next. And then we have, um, and we'll look at those in close up and we'll also look at the gray and white matter in the brain. All right, so in the brain, we have what we call the subarachnoid space, which is also the space between the brain and the structure, the bones. And basically we're trying to cushion the brain from any Im impact, provide kind of a neutral buoyancy and then provide immunological protection to the central nervous system. Also, it's an area where we can get out the waste products and we can also transmit via neuromodulators and neurotransmitters. And if those don't make sense to you now, they will in a little bit. We'll talk about them. We can also, um, it also circulates throughout the brains through the different areas, which would be kind of, we call them the ventricles of the brain between each lobe. It goes into the central canal of the spinal cord. It goes into the subarachnoid space in the brain. And then we also have the blood brain barrier, which is this. And basically the idea of the blood brain barrier is to keep out what we don't want in. So it controls the movement of the water and the solutes like water, oxygen, lipids and into the cerebral spinal fluid and prevents any toxins, pathogens and things from getting into the brain. So we'll look at the endothelial cells, we'll look at the astrocytes, which you'll understand more um, when we look at those close up, but they basically close in around that to hold it all together. So we want to keep um, what's in the blood in the blood in the blood vessels, 
and not out into the whole brain space. We want to keep all the toxins and everything else out. Yeah. And the reason that's important is, as we'll see, even especially with like the viral things that we see later on, this is why this is important to understand is when things get into the brain that shouldn't be there, we also have a problem. And then in the brain, we also have that gray matter, which is found both in the brain and in the spinal cord. And that's what you see. Like when you look at this image of the brain here, we're looking at um, the gray matter really mostly. Um, here it's focused on something else, but you can see that all this um, crinkly stuff is that brain matter, gray matter usually. Mm -hmm. Then we also have two cortexes that we want to talk about, the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex. So the cerebral cortex is what we think of as this big brain area here. And the cerebellar cortex is going to be lower down um, in the cerebellum, which we'll look at. So it's this lower part that you can see here. Um, and they have different functions, which we'll talk about when we get closer to those. What's really interesting to look at is the color changes based on the highest concentration of neurons. So where there's a lot of neurons, you're gonna see white matter. Um, it's gonna look more white. Where there's less neurons, it's gonna look more gray. So in the cerebellum, we have the highest concentration of white matter, which is more than the rest of the brain combined. And the cerebellum, as you'll find out, is responsible for coordination and coordination of movement. So we also have that, the, what you see here in the brain is these, what we call gyri and sulci. The sulci are the little holes and the gyri are the, um, the upper parts of it all. Um, and so you can we can see that as well in the brain. It really helps synapses occur when we have those gyri and sulci. It allows neurons to move through more easily. So what is the function of this gray matter? Really, it controls movement, memory, and emotions. And then we have different gray matters in different areas. Um, I'm not going to talk about them now because we are going to look at them later. Um, but they're here written for you as a reference as well. So white matter contains what we call myelin. It's white in color versus that gray. It coats the neurons. So myelin um, is in... and Oh, sorry, myelin is in the axons of nerve fibers, which connect to neurons in the brain. That's what makes them a functional circuit. So without myelin, we can't transmit information across neurotransmitters. So we have to, if in situations where there isn't my, myelin is when we start having problems. So we're gonna see in which um, issues people have less myelin. Some of them we're gonna look at really closely. It also allows for speed. So places where myelin is thicker or there is more of it, we're gonna get a faster transmission from one spot to the next spot. With less myelin, we're gonna get a slower transmission. So myelin is important in places where we need information right away. Um, learning also, and this is so interesting, is that learning affects the amount of white matter in the brain. Hmm. So you can, even in adults, there's been a lot of research done that helps adults learn new tasks. Um, when, when adults learn new tasks, they have more myelin and more white matter when they're learning new tasks. So you know how I'm sure all of you have heard that we recommend that people um, keep learning as adults or try doing memory games or try learning a new language is a big one, right, among older adults. They can still change the structure of their brain by continued learning, learning a new skill. And in some of them, we'll talk about how learning a new movement pattern can really decrease the amount of deficit that somebody has when they have an issue going on in their brain or spinal cord or nervous system. So here I have a picture of the hemispheres of the brain. Um, it's not super important for you to, like, you obviously don't need to memorize any of this. I just thought it was interesting to see because when somebody has a stroke, which is something we're going to talk about, we're usually talking about one or a brain damage. We're usually talking about one-sided brain damage. And we as moving people think about what does that one-sided brain damage actually do to the body? Um, the one-sided brain damage in a, in a motor sense, right? So if I have a, a damage on the right side of my brain, I'm going to have some deficits on the left side motor function-wise of my brain. And you guys will understand exactly why when we get through this course. But for now, take my word for it. Um, but what we think about is, okay, so 
right side brain damage, they can't move their right arm. They're having a hard time walking there. They don't have control over their left, left side, right side, left arm, left leg. Um, and so that's what we see in a motor sense, but there's all these other things that go on um, in one side of the brain versus the other side of the brain. So not everything happens in both sides of the brain. And so what we see is if somebody has a left, so the left side provides the area where we do all our logic, the right side is more the creative side of the brain. And they are connected by this corpus callosum. So there is connection, we do, they do talk to each other. But, um, and you can see this list here. So on the left, analytical thought, detail-oriented perception, ordered sequencing, rational thought, verbal areas, the cautious area, planning area, it's more math science, more logic. It's the right field of vision, right side motor skills. And then on the right side, we have intuitive thought. We have holistic perception, meaning seeing things in many views, not just in your one little tunnel vision um, view random sequencing, emotional thought, your nonverbal action, your adventurousness, impulse control, creativity, writing art, imagination, left field, the vision, left side motor skills. So if somebody has brain damage to one side, you'll see those motor deficits on the opposite side, but you might also see some of these other things going on as well. And it really becomes prevalent um, when people who have had severe damage on one side Sometimes they turn into these really, from a very nice person into a really person without any impulse control, um, who's shouting out swear words in the hospital bed, like things that are so out of character tend to happen as well. There's, and then they might have, somebody might have problems with planning, um, problems with sequencing, might be able to do one command, follow a one step command, but not a sequenced command in a bunch of a bunch of steps at a time. So that's why this is interesting. So just fun to come back and look at it if you do have a chance to work with somebody who has had a stroke or brain damage. And consider that this is not just the motor, but that some of these things might also be challenging as well. And so here I just broke it down a little bit more. You've got your left digital brain, which is more analytical, verbal, orderly. So damage to that side might take away the ability to speak. It might take away any um, ability to read or compute what they're reading. And then the right side is more that creative emotional side. Um, so they might, it's attention, it's processing of visual shapes and patterns. Um, and, <clears throat> The ability to see a comprehensive picture, it's more the intuitive side and visualizes versus thinks in words. So people can be more, they we say people can be more use, use more one side of the brain than the other side of the brain. So sometimes that's the case too in, in a normal person without any issues, but it's just an interesting thing. Okay, so here we're looking at, now we're taking the skull away and we're looking at the brain without the bones, right? So. In the forebrain, uh, we call the cerebrum or cerebral cortex, which would be this sort of area of the brain. It's the largest part. It processes our sensory information. It's our reasoning and problem solving. It regulates our autonomic endocrine and motor function. So this is where we're moving from, right? The midbrain, which is kind of the brain stem, we can, and we'll look at this a little bit more in detail in a minute. Um, the brain stem, the thalamus in this area here, helps to regulate movement. And it's where you process your visual and auditory information. So getting in that information. The hindbrain, which is this area back here, is the cerebellum. So it helps to auto, uh, regulate autonomic fun function. It helps relay sensory information. And the big, one, the big ones here for us are coordinate movement and maintain balance and equilibrium. So somebody who has a problem in the area of the cerebellum is you're gonna see discoordination and you're gonna see difficulty with balance uh, and equilibrium. So if we wanna look at the lobe, so that frontal lobe, which is we can see a little window of back here in the very front part of the brain here, um, the functions for it, the most important for Pilates is muscle control, voluntary movement, serial task and the ability to initiate behaviors, which is also partly happening in the cerebellum, but this is where we're getting that from. So that frontal cortex is where we're doing most of what we're doing when we're doing actual 
general mo muscle movement work. Other important functions are organize, plan, make facial expressions, problem solve, control inhibition, spontaneity, pay attention, remember, and control emotion. So this doesn't finish developing. And now they're saying until like 25 in boys, I think it may be a little bit earlier in girls, but it's really late in the development. So I tell my kids who are the older two are 18 and 16 and I tell them, but you just don't get it because your brain's not done developing. So you will never understand <laughs> um, why I can't let you go and do that thing that you're asking to do. Right. So really they won't have that full development. It's problem solving and controlling inhibition. So it, it is an issue in teens. Um, they they think that sometimes because the frontal lobe hasn't developed all the way, that's why teenage males or 20-year-old males do things that they probably shouldn't have done um, until after it's too late. So um, that is that is the thing. Um, and then it also has the frontal cortex, also has the Broca's area, which is related to language and speech. The parietal lobe, which is on our side here of the brain, um, its functions are complex behaviors and senses. Most important in the Pilates world would be body awareness, facial orientation, integration of sensory information, manipulation of objects, body position and movement, and then left and right differentiation. So there must be something wrong with my parietal lobe because I can never tell my right from my left. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you other instructors have that problem, but um, it's really hard to tell the right and left, especially when you're looking at somebody else and Anyway, just kidding. I don't think there's anything wrong, but this is where that's coming from. Um, other important functions, vision, touch, pain, and pressure, knowledge of numbers, ability to construct ne and neglect, inattention, self-awareness, insight. So that would be parietal lobe. And then if we go to the occipital lobe, which, lobe, which is the one right at the back of the skull there. So we're looking towards the back here. There we go right here, just above the cerebellum. We're looking back here. Um, this is where we are visual, doing visual processing, visual recogni recognition, visual attention, spatial analysis, and then visual perception of body language. And then the temporal lobe, which is right on the side of the skull here. Okay, well, I'm not gonna bother with that too much. Um, is perception and auditory processing. So it's basically right over the ear, that area right here. Um, includes the hippocampus and the amygdala, which we'll talk about again later. Functions are perception and auditory processing, comprehension of spoken language, verbal memory, visual memory, language production, general knowledge and memories. There's an area called Wernicke's area, which is the production of written and spoken language. And then the limbic area, which is sort of that emotional area. All right, and here, here we are again. If we're looking at um, motor areas, we're looking at the primary motor cortex, which is right here. We've got the premotor cortex, if we divide this up. We've got that Broca's area, which is related to language and speech. We have the frontal eye field and this whole prefrontal cortex. And then you can see here we have the sensory areas, um, primary somata sensory cortex, the somatosensory association cortex, and then taste, which is less important for us right now, but it's up in here. And then we have the visual cortex, um, auditory areas, auditory cortex. So you can see this is just a nice diagram that has the functional areas of the cerebral cortex sort of labeled for you. And then I just put in another note about Wernicke's area and Broca's area, which is what we talked about for comprehension of language and speech production and articulation, so spoken and written. So just to keep in mind that somebody who has an issue with their brain might have some deficit in one of these things. If it's frontal lobe, they might have trouble with speech production articulation. If it's temporal lobe, they might have comprehension and language processing problems. Um, okay, and then we go into the brain stem. Let me just see if I can do a better job and pull this up for you. Here, when we're talking about the brain stem, we're looking at pons medulla and the medulla oblongata and the midbrain. The brain stem you want to think of as that vital life function. So if something goes wrong in the brain stem, chances are the person will not survive the accident, injury, whatever it is. The brain stem keeps us alive, really. It's in part responsible for consciousness. 
It controls the muscles responsible for biting, chewing, swallowing, and heart rate. Um, it stimulates and controls the intensity of breathing, depth, and frequency of breath, control of your sleep cycle, respiration, and reflexes, such as those that startle response, the autonomic nervous system functioning, and vestibular function. So that's going to also affect your balance. Transfers neural messages to and from the brain and spinal cord. And it is the junction between the brain and the spinal cord. So you need to think that everything that's getting into the brain is passing through this brainstem in some way, shape, or form, right? So if there's a problem at the brainstem level, the brain might be fine, but you might not get the information there. Parts, uh, again, this is going to connect the cerebellum with the forebrain. So we said already vision, hearing, and motor control, sleep wakefulness, and then it houses houses oculomotor and trochlear nerves. So basically your eyes, it house, houses the functions of your eyes in there, which are not that important for us, but just nice to know. Um, and then we also have the messages from the cortex to the central nervous system for coordination coming through here. And then the substantia nigra, which I like to bring up. I don't think I have it on this picture. I don't think I have a picture of it yet for you, but I will get one. Um, but it has the neurons that make dopamine. So this is going to relate directly to Parkinson's disease because that is what we don't have enough of um, in Parkinson's disease. We need that for coordination of movement. The substantia nigra function is imperative. We also, in the midbrain, we have the limbic system, which is that emotional brain from the temporal lobe. Um, we have a bunch of different structures in there. They're not so important for us as movement practitioners, but I just have them listed here because they're really important to keep us going. So I'll just go through them quickly, just so you have awareness about them. The thalamus, basically relaying sensory information from the brain to the cerebral cortex, Hypothalamus regulates the pituitary gland and endocrine activity. So your hormone regulation, sleep regulation, sleep, uh, appetite. The amygdala is your memories and emotion. Like when you have a traumatic event in life, this is where it's stored in your amyg amygdala. And then the hippocampus is also memory forming. It organizes and stores information, gets new memories happening and connection between emotions and your senses. So this is what's when you're, smell something and it makes you remember something that's coming from that hippocampus. And then we have, if we go a little bit deeper, we have these other areas, which we are gonna get into. The most important for us right now is um, that what the function of the midbrain is, which is that it collects information from the visual and auditory systems. And then we also have in there, the red nucleus and the substantia nigra which control body movement and have many dopamine producing neurons. So degeneration of which leads to Parkinson's disease. And there's a few other diseases that are similar that have that same, um, that are affected by those neurons not being present or the substantia nigra not prov providing enough neurons. The pituitary gland is a gland that it links the nervous system and the endocrine system. So that's really why it's important. It um, works for growth and development. It helps with metabolism, sexual development, and the reproductive system. This becomes less important if somebody's passed through puberty into adulthood, but still um, really re necessary for growth and development, proper growth and development. Then we have the pons and medulla, which we can look at here. The pons, there we go. We've got the pons here, the medulla oblongata here. So basically the pons means bridge. It's a bridge between the nervous system, um, between the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex. The pons houses a lot of our cranial nerves. We're gonna look at those cranial nerves because they're super important to our function. Um, and then it also regulates sleep, REM sleep, which is the restful sleep that we need. The medulla is basically regulating breathing, swallowing, heart, heart rate. It's the top of the spinal cord. It has two distinct parts, the pyramids and pyramidal desiccation. This sounds probably like totally foreign to you now, but this is important because this is where the crossover happens, meaning 
we said earlier that if I have a problem in the right side of the brain, I'm going to have dysfunction on the left side. It's in these pyramids where we cross over, where that information crosses from one side of the brain to the other side of the body. So that's happening in the medulla. The other we have is the inferior olivary nucleus, which is which connects the medulla to the cerebellum. So there we can get the messages transferred from the spinal cord into the brain. And so it, there's nerves, uh, these are also cranial nerves that are in, from the medulla that go into the brain. And we'll look at them in detail. Okay, and now we're at the cerebellum. So a lot of people call the cerebellum the little brain. It's basically for regulation and coordination of movement, posture, balance, cardiac, um, respiration and vasomotor centers. So what does that all mean for us in terms of movement? We're worried about being able to coordinate movement. And what that means is that fine motor control. If you don't have the cerebellum, what does the movement look like? Do you guys know what movements look like when the cerebellum is not doing its job properly? Some of you do. I'm afraid to say that so the movement becomes very like um, not smooth. We get this... Um, like a stop start movement. So if you went to pull somebody's arm, instead of pulling it and going down like this, you would have little breaks in the movement along the way. Um, you would be have a hard time. So some of the things we see are a hard time starting or stopping a motion. Um, once you get going in a motion, coordinating so that you don't trip as you're moving, for example. Um, so these are all things that are super important that happen in the cerebellum. Damage can result in many different dysfunctions, including ataxia, ataxia. And then we have dystidokinesia, which is those rapid alternating movements. Nystagmus, which is basically your eyeballs shaking in your, your eyes can't stay still. So they move, they wobble in your eye socket. You get the intention tremor that we see with Parkinson's disease. Dysarthria, which is basically difficulty swallowing and hypotonia, so less muscle tone. So then we can go into the basal ganglia, which is sort of that subcortical region, so underneath the cortex. So if we went down and inside, we'd get into the basal ganglia. And that's um, interconnected nuclei that control functions. So they're primarily responsible for motor control. They are the start and stop neurons. So they regulate movement, they including motor learning, executive function, and related behaviors to executive function and emotions. So their they're subcortical is underneath that cortex. So we'd have to go down and inside that brain to see them. And then they have um, other related nuclei, um, which we're not gonna focus on right now, but they're all listed here for you. Um, so with what's most important in this set is really looking at knowing that these things relate a lot to that striatum nigra and the basal ganglia, so that the substantia nigra, so that we're gonna have problems. If we have problems there, we're gonna have problems that also affect movement and coordination. So all the nuclei you don't need to know per se, but here they all are for you in case you wanna dig deeper. Here we have the two most important. We've already talked briefly about the substantia nigra, which are the dopaminergic nucleus, where we create those neurons um, and we need for proper movement. It's leading right into that basal ganglia. So when they're damaged, we get all these dysfunctions like Parkinson's, Huntington, also Tourette syndrome. Also, they linked it with schizophrenia, even ADHD and OCD when they're not working properly. The subthalamic nucleus is there as well, but it doesn't have a clear function. We know that it's a component, it's that direct pathway um, of the motor control through the basal ganglia. So it's the idea is that it keeps your muscle actions in check. What does that mean? It means it makes the action the right thing for the movement that you have to create. Meaning if I pick up my mouse, I'm picking it up, I'm not squashing it, destroying it but I'm holding it tight enough so it doesn't fall out of my hand. But how do I know how to do that? Something's telling me, maybe based on experience to some extent, but also just happening innately, I know when I see that structure, I'm not gonna have to squeeze the life out of it. I know that I don't have to hold so hard. Um, I don't wanna crush it. 
right? Imagine holding a raw egg if you can't regulate how much pressure goes onto that egg, right? We would end up maybe crushing it because we'd push too hard. So that is what we think that subthalamic nucleus um, helps us with. So um, also here, here's again the parts of those basal ganglia. The putamen is there, the caudic nucleus and the putamen. So this is all information that you don't need to know for now. So it's here though, as a reference, as I said earlier, I told you I gave you too much information. Um, so I think we should pause here. This is, um, we'll get into the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Oh, actually I've got, I'm gonna do two more because then we get to cranial nerves. We can stop there. So the thalamus, basically the primary function is to relay information from the body to the appropriate area of the cerebral cortex. So we have like 50 nuclei in there, each one giving functioning to process information. So you don't need to know what all of those are really, um, but they're here for your information as well. Just know that they're like really working with communication and relaying information from us. So sensory information um, and communication between the brain uh, allowing for cognitive function. So that's really what that overview of the thalamus is about. And then the hypothalamus is just below that thalamus. So hypo meaning below. It's connected to that pituitary gland and helps it function as well. Um, communicates and interacts with the endocrine system. And then it's also connected to many brain functions of the higher brain function. So things that we will look at in a little bit later on. But basically, these are the connections up through into the brain and cortex. So I know I just dumped so much information on you. Um, I'm sure that you have some questions. Thank you so much, Zaina. You're welcome. Thank you guys for being here. All right. Well, hopefully I'll get to see some of you next week. Um, if not, please keep in touch regardless. And um, I'm sure our paths will cross. <laughs>